Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. I'm not going to be long before you today. I am uh, in this place ever since last Sunday or through Wednesday. Especially on Wednesday, the Lord has had me in Ecclesiastes. For whatever reason, I'm here. And I have gotten to the point where I am no longer even pushing or resisting what God is saying. I just accept it and just go in the vein. I just go with him. I, I'm, I might be scratching my head, but I'm scratching while I go. You know, at this same time, we are understanding that even in the world today that we are embracing what is known as wisdom. Everyone wants wisdom. The Bible says if a man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives it liberally. But I want us to be uh, attentive just for a few moments on today. I know God wants to speak to us. I know he wants to speak to me. But Ecclesiastes is known as three, one of the three books of wisdom. The first one being Proverbs, the other one being Job, and this book, Ecclesiastes, is known as the third book of, the, of wisdom. But God has been speaking to me as it pertains to something that I think that we all each and every day deal with, whether we realize it or not. It is a high commodity. It is an extremely high commodity. Let me just read the verse. I am going to begin reading in verse number 10, and I'm just going to verse number 12. It says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. I returned and saw the sun, saw under the sun, excuse me, that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill, but time and chance happen to them all. Let me say that again, but time and chance happen to them all. For man also does not know his time. Like fish taken in a cruel net, like birds caught in a snare, so the sons of men are snared in an evil time when it falls suddenly upon them. I'm going to just take for a brief moment a text. It's about time. It's about time. I am one of those, you know, as long as I can remember an avid lover of music. I can remember as l far back as my mind can take me, whether it be three or four, I don't know what the age is, but I can go all the way back to being walked in church by my mother and sitting in the front row at Trinity Temple, Church of God in Christ in Palm Bluff, Arkansas as my dad would sit on the side and play the guitar, I would become more enamored by the drummer. Sitting on the front row as a child, I would watch everything he did from taking his keys out of his pocket to sitting his Bible down on the chair and I would sit on the front row and I would mimic him from point A to point Z. I would watch everything he did and being mesmerized by the instrument that he was playing, the drums, I would sit on the front row and I would go through all of the motions that he went through. It wouldn't end there. I didn't get enough while at church. I would go home and I would set up my own makeshift drums. Though I didn't have drums, I would set up a pot and a pan. And I would set up a couple of books and reach into one of the drawers and take out a couple utensils and use those as my drumsticks. 
And in that moment, I would become the very person that I was looking at. I would become the drummer in church. I would visualize the church and being the musician in church supporting a big ministry. As time would go on, I would find that I would not just mimic that man, that I would also become like that man. I would take what I had seen at a young age and carry that into my adolescence and would find that from being the age of 13 or 14 playing drums for the adult choir, I found that music had become something that was my niche. But there was something that enamored me, and I don't know that if any of you have thought along this line, but I, I kind of joke sometimes with my friend, with my best friend, I joke, I said, you know, it seems like as a musician you think kind of strangely. You think of things in a different way than everyone else. As a singer, you think differently. And that's one thing that I love is music. It's music. I love a great song. I love a song that is so good that I will listen to it from beginning to end and go back and listen from beginning to end and go back and listen to, from it, to it from beginning to end. Sometimes it would get so good in listening to it that you would escape your very moment and go into the song and become the artist in the song. Right. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Where you would hear the song, you love the melody, you love the beat, you love the way it makes you feel, and you close your eyes and you imagine that you are the one that has created and written the very song that you're enjoying. I would not oftentimes let the song get to the end before I would stop it and go right back to the beginning. I would hit play and once it gets to my favorite part, I would hate for the favorite part to get so far that I would stop the song and go right back to the beginning because I'm like, this is my favorite part. It's the part where the singer is going to sing that favorite run that you, it just does something to you when you hear it. Come on, y'all. Y'all can talk to me. It's, it's that part where as a musician you hear the drama do something and it, you stop. You say, wait a minute. That's, that's got to be crazy. Let me go back. The days before YouTube when you did not get a chance to see what they did, you had to stop and listen. The song. And as, as a lover of music, the one thing that God has been dealing with me all these years and even up to Wednesday after coming out of consecration is God has had me to focus on time. I know it's going to make sense. Music for me is one of those things that God has caused me at a young age and even now to, to look face to face and say that even in, at its greatest, it is yet limited to time. You can't play your favorite song from now until eternity. Your time has a beginning and an ending. The favorite song that you love, I don't care how often you play it, at some point it will end. You can hum it over and over again, but at some point it will end. God has been revealing more and more to me about how we are as mankind and womankind, as children kind, as we walk up under the sun. This thing with time we are all enamored with. Because as I'm standing here talking to you about great music and great songs, some of you have time traveled since I've started talking. Some of you have traveled into tomorrow. Some have traveled into this afternoon. And some have traveled to yesterday. The one thing that it is hard for us to embrace and harness and hold on to is time. We get 
what we desire of the Lord. And we don't stand in the moment of time. We go beyond that in order to try to duplicate where we are. God is reminding me that we are all enamored by time. You may not know how influential time is, but I want you to think about it. That even right now, everything, even in Ecclesiastes, I thought I would be led to uh, the familiar chapter that is read at funerals. There is a time for everything. But God is like, no, y'all really don't understand that you and your worst enemy besides the devil is time. Because I'm not beholden to time, but you are. When Adam and Eve fell, the one thing that we thought about when he said that if you eat of this tree, the one thing that will happen is you will surely die. But we bypassed death and forgot about time. Time became of the essence. I look at myself and I, this morning as I got dressed, I realized that I am not 18 anymore. I don't have the flat stomach like I used to and my clothes drape off of me as if I have a problem. My clothes seemingly adjust week to week or meal to meal. That's time. Time for us is even in the moment at this very moment I am enamored by the season. I'm this guy that I think of what I do every single day. Yeah, I told you I'm a little peculiar because here we are again right at the beginning of October and we're already getting prepared in time for what we have done for every year previous to this, which is Christmas. You can't even go in the store now at the beginning of October and at least just relished the right now, they want to push you into time and have you to already look past Thanksgiving. Don't give thanks, but look past Thanksgiving and go to what have you done for me lately? Have you acknowledged me? Can you give me something? We bypass all of that. This is one of those things where God is saying at this very moment, you are sandwiched in between time. You are either living in the past, the present, or the future. But the truth is, many of us don't live in the present. We're either living in our past, or we're li living for the future. Many of us really don't, if I could say this, the majority of us really don't look at right now. What is God doing right now? What are you doing right now? And all of us are preparing for something else other than right now. What can I do tomorrow? We woke up this morning thinking about tomorrow's appointment. <laughs> we woke up this morning thinking about what we're going to do next week. When, in fact, the scripture that I just read, the author is letting us know, he's telling us throughout the whole book of Ecclesiastes, he's telling us that uh, your life at this point is nothing but vanity. Who is this that's talking to us? Some will argue that it is Solomon, who is the man that has wisdom bottled and and. and patented and able to give out to everyone but he says I've had everything I've had all the money you could have I had every opportunity he said but one thing that I have that you also have is time and the only time you have is now you don't have tomorrow he's telling us at this point that right now he said even for those of us in this space, he said, I want you to understand as you read the book of Ecclesiastes, he's reminding you no matter where you are, whether you're rich, 
Whether you're poor, whether you're happy, whether you're sad, whether you have or you have not. All you have is right now. See, many of us live for our success. He said, but even success is vanity. Getting rich is vanity. Y'all, God is saying, I want you to be in the moment with me. I want you to enjoy this moment. I found it challenging because once you've experienced loss, the only thing you do is look at time. We don't, we, don't, we don't look at time the same way we do when we're successful. Because when we are succeeding, we don't see it as ending. The author in Ecclesiastes said, it's just as sure as you are having joy, you will also have sadness. He's reminding us just as sure as you have money, you will also have brokenness. He said, at this point, all you must do is focus on what you have right now. In verse 10, he says, while you have time, when you have the time right now, whatever your hand finds to do, he said, don't waste time. Do it. He said, do it with all your might, because if you do it half heartedly, you might just time travel and go back to what you wish you had done. This 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 text, we've all heard this and we've all misquoted this where it says the race is not given to the swift nor the battle to the strong, and we would insert our own in here, but to the one that endures until the end. But the, the writer is saying it ain't even given to the one that endures until the end. He stops by saying, at this point, life ain't fair. This literally is what Ecclesiastes is telling us, that life is not fair. That no matter how you size up your own life, it will not be fair to you. Why is that? Because the fall of man is deemed it so. And God won't change it. He says that, he says that even at this point, he says that the race is not given to the swift. He says that even the fastest one running, the fastest one running could lose the race. It is possible that the one that is running the fastest will not finish the race. The one that is running the fastest will not be out front. Saying life is so unfair that even at your fastest, life can catch you midway and cause you to be crippled to not make it to the finish line. So when we say that life is not given to the swift nor to the strong, but to the one that endures to the end, we are in error. Because life is given to the one that's in the moment. In the very moment that God is operating, not into tomorrow. And we show, no, you can't run a race looking backwards. But we all have the habit of doing so. Says that, nor bread to the wise. What he says in this, he's saying that even if you have money, to pay for what you want. He says life is still not fair. He says, yeah, you may have money, but they may not sell you what you want. <laughs> Say you may have all the riches, but your money still won't provide it. You will go in demanding because you can pay for it. But he's saying life is not fair. We, we often look at it. I, I don't know if y'all have thought about this like me. Our world is conditioned that those who have money don't have to pay and those who don't have money have to pay. Uh -huh. Oh, y'all missed that. No. Y'all watch that those who are who have the all of the money can go in and people recognize them and will give them yeah. 
yeah. the meal for free, but then you come in dressed as if you just came from under a bridge and they demand either you pay or leave. Yeah. Life in itself yeah. is subject to what we all have taken for granted, which is time. I'm almost done. I have come to this thing even now where the scripture says, nor favor to men of skill. I find this in particular for those who have worked hard and diligently at what you do and have found that your reward is not quite as you anticipated and expected it to be. And we go to God saying, God, this is not fair that this has turned out this way. He said, no, this is life. Yeah. That all that you've put your hands to doesn't always equal the results that you expect. Mm -hmm. uh, as believers, that, that kind of trumps us because in reading Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes can be a very depressing book to read. I ask God, why do you lead me to something that doesn't uplift us in a way that makes us shout and see that you are glorified? He says, I am glorified, but I want to be glorified in your right now. No matter what right now looks like, I want to be glorified in your right now. It may be raining, but I want to be glorified while it's raining. Don't don't expect it that when it starts raining, that you're looking ahead of the rain and waiting for the sun. So you won't celebrate while it's raining. You will just wait until the sun comes out. He says, no, I want you to live in this moment. Why is that? Because the next one is not guaranteed. The next moment is not guaranteed. Yeah. This is hard for those of us when we say things like, you know, you know, I, nothing good happens to me because once I get something good, it always turns tragic. But this is why God is saying, again, seize the moment. Y'all, you know, when you grow up, you know, struggling, you have this mindset of always looking for the struggle to come take over hijack everything you have and so you have this mindset of always being out front but what God is is constantly showing me at this point is I want you to be right here in the moment which is where the devil doesn't want you to be doesn't want you to enjoy the blessings of the Lord at this very moment the scripture says the blessings of the Lord make it rich and he adds no sorrow with it we are the ones that add sorrow because when he blesses us, we're looking beyond the moment of being blessed into when will he bless us again. We can't enjoy what he's given us, so I'm looking at what will he give me again. It says today, as this entire book of Ecclesiastes reminds us, he says, he says, life is like a vapor says that you can't, you can't hold it. You can reach your hand out to grab it, but you can't, you can't touch it. You can try to hold it in your hand, but when you open it, it's not there. He says life is like chasing the wind. You can't see it and you don't know which way it's going, but that's what we do when we don't honor God in the moment. Y'all, this, for us as you grow, we all must understand that this really is about the time that you have right now. Yeah, we don't like to look at it. You know, we want to believe that tomorrow the sun's going to come up and it's going to be just as we had planned it to be. But I am constantly reminded of days that have changed that were unlike the day before where you wake up and it was something that day was just uniquely different about that day where God is saying this is how fast things can change the, under my eyes <laughs> you know I thank Mother Joanne because Mother Joanne has given me this eye cream <laughs> uh, this eye cream now I'm a guy, I don't, you know, I don't wear makeup or anything like that. But I find that what is, <laughs> what is happening is time 
is refusing to stop. As I get older, I see the lines under my eyes and I see the lines in my forehead starting to become more defined. I see the lines in my hands as they become more defined. I see the little ache on, on my hip every now and then that tells you to shift when you used to be able to sleep in that position all night. Your body is telling you that it's about time. It's about time. God is saying that at some point, your time will run out. I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but you look around in here, the probability that all of us in this room will be here a hundred years from now is almost next to nothing. A hundred years, and a hundred years is no time, but the time that you have is right now. What is it? I'm going to say this and I'm done. I asked God, I said, God, I, I come to you and I'm excited about what you're saying. And God has said to me all this week, I want you to slow down. Because each week you come expecting what I'm going to do for you the next week. But I want you to slow down and I want you to embrace this time. You examine where you are in your life and you're trying to figure out, God, when is it going to get better? I hope tomorrow it will be better so you don't live for today. God is saying, don't push yourself into tomorrow because you might not like what tomorrow brings. It's hard when you're used to living in yesterday and tomorrow. But God is saying, I want you to enjoy me today. And those circumstances may come and arise to make you feel as if there is nothing worth enjoying. My relationship with you is always worth enjoying, no matter where you are. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm reminded of this, and I'm going to close. I'm reminded of the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. They had no food. They were hungry and they were desperate to eat. And the Lord spoke and said, I'm going to provide you something to eat. He said, but what I want you to do is I want you to get only today's portion. He said, now be mindful that you don't get more than today. He said, now, when you get toward the weekend, I want you to prepare for the Sunday or the Sabbath so you don't work that day. That's the only time that you will store up. But people being people, being hungry, excited to eat, decided that they would go opposite of what God said. And what they did was they would store up and start to grab more of the manna that God had provided and they would stick it and stuff it in places and store it and hide it, even though they were told not to do it. And they hid it, not knowing what it would really cause them to deal with. As they would hide and stuff what God said not to that be just trust me that I will be faithful to provide this same thing every single day. That what they did was they hoarded it up and they found out that after they hoarded it up, that after they ate today's portion, they went into tomorrow's portion and tried to eat tomorrow's portion and it already developed worms. And the Bible says that it's stunk wasn't worth eating. God is saying to us today, stop trying to store up tomorrow because harnessing tomorrow will do nothing but stink. Trying to corral tomorrow's portion will do nothing but 
nothing but discourage you because it won't be what you've expected it to be. It will be completely opposite of what you thought it would be. It won't be fresh. <laughs> Tomorrow's not going to be fresh because you've already planned what tomorrow will be. And God is saying at this point, just wait for tomorrow. Right. And tomorrow, I want you to enjoy me tomorrow. Right. And I, I know this is for me. I know this is for me. Because when you wake up and you're thinking about what is today, you automatically go in tomorrow and hoping that tomorrow, God, I didn't win a lottery today, maybe I'll win it tomorrow. God, I didn't get what I wanted today, but maybe I'll get it tomorrow. But God is saying you need to seize the day. This is it, I'm closing right here. We've talked about our greatest enemy outside of Satan is time and I want you to think about this when you leave here that everything that you are doing right now is subject to time nothing is exempt from time that's what the writer is telling us he said everything you own everything you have everything you will ever possess will change in time that's why he said you need to be serving a God who is timeless. That's the only, that's the only hope you have is God. Yes. Not what you can obtain with your hands. Not what you can do with your mind. Said that even after a while, even your mind with time will start to go away. Even your own vernacular and the way you could think. You know, it's amazing. It's amazing that even just in my 50s, I find that I have to make myself work at remembering. Remembering, I come downstairs to, to, I know what I came downstairs to do. And then go right to the place and go, wait a minute, what did I come down here for? God is saying, that's time. You can't stop that no matter how much you pray, you ain't going to stop that. Because it's reminding you that your days are limited. Yeah, I know some kids are like they forget. Now nah, you don't forget like this. <laughs> you don't forget like this when you know you sat there and you said, I, I got to get this. I got to run down and get this. You run all the way down with an urgency and just as sure as you get down there, you go, now, wait a minute. I came down here for something. God is saying live in the moment.